first of all, um, I have no financial disclosure. And um, a big portion of my talk, I'm going to talk about the black blood management and then other pharmacological agent to consider part of the obstetrical hemorrhage and other safety bundle. So with that, I'm going to start with history of blood transfusion um, to talk a little bit about uh, historical perspective. So in 1628, Dr. William Harvey discovered the circulation of blood. And in 1667, transition from blood um, sheep to human started. And in 1818, Dr. James Blendell, who was an obstetrician, performed first human blood transfusion for treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. And in 1901, human blood groups were discovered. And subsequently, in 19... 39 to 40, our age blood group system was discovered to make transfusion process safer. Fast forward, there were multiple advances in 20th century to make blood transfusion and blood management safer. Um, US has developed national blood collection system, and long-term anticoagulants such as sodium citrate were developed and added, and routine testing of ABO typing and syphilis were performed, and in the late 1960s, plasmapheresis and platelet transfusion began um, were, um, introduced um, for the uh, purpose. And then happy surface antigen testing began. And finally, in the 1990s, HIV and hep C testing were approved by the FDA. With that, I just want to refresh um, about um, obstetrical hemorrhage definition, which um, was um, published in ACOG Practice, bull, uh, practice bulletin in late 2017. So um, before that, there was a delineation of patient either had cesarean delivery or vaginal delivery, and the definition may vary. However, this, with this new ACOG practice bulletin, blood loss of greater than 1,000 cc or either blood loss accompanied by signs or symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours of birth process should fit into obstetrical hemorrhage. So as we all know, it's a major source of maternal morbidity and mortality in the developed and underdeveloped countries, up to 25% of maternal death worldwide, and case fatality rate is about 2%. It's one of the most common admission for OB patient to the ICU. And Dr. Rawlings has already pointed out the trends in pregnancy-related mortality. However, I just want to um, base um, brush like um, softly that we, um, in the U.S., in between 1987 to 2013, pregnancy trends in pregnancy-related um, mortality has more than doubled, and actually peak around 2010 era, currently about 17.3 um, pregnancy-related dead per 100,000 life brought in the U.S. With being said that um, hemorrhage accounted for 11. Point um, four percentage of pregnancy-related death in between 2011 and 2013, and is the number four leading cause of death in, in the United States. And however, the rate of transfusion is fairly low in the obstetrical hemorrhage um, population. It's 0.9 to 2.3 percent. However, the transfusion rate has increased in the past decade. Even then, the massive transfusion of more than 10 units of blood cell is really rare. It's only out of six out of 10,000 delivery, going to do multiple studies. So the rest of the, um, my talk, I'll focus on what is part of optimal preparation. Um, blood products preparation is um, one part, and um, MTP protocol, cell salvage, and pharmacological agents such as fibrinogen concentrate and trinacemic acid. And also, lastly, I'll touch base about um, hemorrhagic safety bundle checklist. So um, blood products preparation, does any, everybody who um, come to labor and delivery need blood products or are uh, tested? Per ASA uh, 2016 um, practice guideline, routine cross-match is not necessarily for a healthy and uncomplicated patient. So one, um, whether one patient should either type and screen, cross-match should be entirely based on the patient maternal history and anticipated hemorrhagic complication and risk factor, and also based on local institutional policies and how vigorous the blood bank is. So what has been recommended is that um, each institution should have a routine assessment of hemorrhagic risk at multiple time points, prenatal admission, add to the either antepartum unit or labor and delivery, or at any appropriate time points that has been 
recommended by many studies. So with that, I just want to introduce to um, the CMQCC um, Obstetric Hemorrhage Toolkit um, Hemorrhage Risk Factor Evaluation. Um, so this toolkit is readily available um, to use online. Um, this toolkit came out, this is a version number two and came out in 2015. Per CMQCC, um, the guideline, the uh, risk factor group, the um, obstetric patient into three um, risk category. Low risk category um, guideline doesn't recommend um, no, not even type and screening, just clot holding in the um, blood bank. So those patients are um, such patients such that um, no previous uterine incision, single term pregnancy, less than full vaginal birth, no known bleeding disorder or no history of postpartum hemorrhage. The medium risk group patient are such that um, they recommended type and screening um, the patients, and those patients include prior cesarean birth or uterine surgery, multiple gestation, or more than four vaginal birth in the history, current history of infections such as choreo, history of postpartum hemorrhage, and large uterine fibroids. The high risk groups are the group of patients, CMQCC guideline recommended type and cross match, and however, the amount of blood products should cross match entirely based upon the patient uh, risk factor and also how rigorous the blood bank is. So those patients include placenta anomalies such as placenta previa, um, procreta accreta, and very anemic patient and thrombocytopenic patient, and active bleeding disorder and known coagulopathy. Um, so the guideline is out there and each institution can modify this guideline based on the patient population and the needs. With that, I want to um, talk about the study, which um, the study author tried to validate whether this CMCCC risk group actually predicted the risk of hemorrhage or not. So these studies author did a one-year retrospective cohort study, about 10,000 women in a single hospital. Um, each mother were assigned to one of the three risk group, and the, um, the result is that the um, incidence of significant peripartum hemorrhage is low in um, low risk group, only 0.8%, medium group has about 2%, and high risk group has about 7.3%. And in fact, the high risk group is um, statistical analysis is very, um, p-value is really low, and showing that these high risk groups patients indeed have a much higher risk to have a significant peripartum hemorrhage. However, this study author pointed out that the CMQCC guideline was not, not very conclusive, doesn't have uh, um, maternal mor like morbidity such as obesity and hypertensive disorder, so they recommended that each institution um, does risk stratify the patient based on the patient population. With that, I just want to touch base about um, MTP protocol, or massive transfusion protocol. So um, each institution may have, um, most of the tertiary care center has massive transfusion protocol, um, may slightly vary, but the purpose is to have an early transfusion during massive hemorrhage, and, so, and then patient may have um, early accessibility of different blood types, uh, different blood products, and improves the timeline to transfusion and can be cost effective. Also, the communication between the blood bank and the OR can be improved, and it ensures that the patient can have blood products until hemostasis is achieved or um, someone stop the massive transfusion protocol. Currently, this is our institutional massive transfusion protocol. So if someone were to call the blood bank or um, order for massive transfusion protocol, um, the blood bank may, will issue um, four units of and cross match PRBC, O negative, and four unit of FFP, and one unit of like that. These bloods are readily available within five minutes um, since the order is displaced, and FFP need to be thawed, so it can take about 10 minutes. So for this protocol for us, pipe and screen may or may not be needed. It can be expired, but however, the blood band would issue um, those blood products. But does it have a validation that this MTP protocol actually helps or not? So um, this study actually did a res uh, retrospective study to look into the etiology of postpartum hemorrhage, and they also look into the transfusion outcomes and laboratory indices of patients who require MTP. So they look into uh, about over the 31 months period. During that time frame, um, this institution has 31 patients who received who 
who were activated with MTP protocol, and 61% of them had cesarean delivery, 32% had vaginal delivery, and 7% had DNE procedure. Only 84% who actually the order MTP protocol received blood product, but however, the post transfusion um, laboratory indices were very favorable. Uh, hemoglobin level was high, 10.3, plate accounts were great, and fibrinogen level was high. So in, um, they concluded that um, massive transition protocol actually ensures better product availability and also um, has a favorable outcome in that institution. So the next part I would touch base about cell salvage, and we all know that cell salvage decreased the need for blood transfusion. However, there is a theoretical risk in OB population about amniotic fluid embolism and also induction of maternal um, allo immunization process. With that, we um, use the leukocyte depletion filter and rogam administration has made the cell salvage really safe. Um, the next slides, I will go over the safety of self salvage based on um, a lot of um, trials published out there. So this study published in 2015 looks into multiple trials which use um, self salvage in the obstetric patient population and the adverse outcome. And um, only one study, McDonald's studies, have shown that one patient had an explained episode of hypotension even with the use of leukocyte depletion um, filter. All the others. Um, studies or trials have no adverse outcome. So cell salvage can be considered um, with, um, with either the med medical indications or obstetrical indication of uh, patient populations such that patient with thrombocytopenia, um, severely anemic patient, or patient with um, positive antibodies such that rare blood type, or cross, um, very difficult to cross match, or some patients who may have um, religious reason or personal reason to, uh, to refuse blood product. OB indication includes placenta anomalies, prior uterine rupture, and bleeding disorder, placenta um, abruption, and abnormal placentation. So those are some of the indications to be considered for cell salvage. Again, it can be based on institutional policy or based on patient risk factor. This is just to show that coagulation cascade we all know about, that intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway work together to form um, blood clots and work on the coagulation. Um, I will, next slides, I will just touch base slowly about uh, hemostasis changes in a pregnancy. So one, a few things I wanted to point it out, the audience all know is fibrinogen level is increased more than 100% in pregnancy, and platelet count may decrease about 20%, and D-dimer level increase up to 400%. With that all being said, pregnancy is known for hypercoagulable state. And the next slides, I'm going to talk about fibrinogen concentrate um, and fibrinogen. Um, fibrinogen has been a useful predictor in many studies to show that um, for progression from moderate to massive uh, postpartum hemorrhage and the need for blood transfusion. And fibrinogen concentrate has, concentrate has been approved to treatment of acute bleeding in patients with congenital fibrinogen deficiency. However, early um, studies in obstetrical populations showed that fibrinogen concentrate is equally efficacious as cryoprecipitate for treatment of hemorrhage, but not superior. But I just want to point out, like I'd go over the, um, the recently published study which used an algorithm to show that um, if given earlier during the um, massive hemorrhage, it can uh, reduce the blood loss and also can reduce the amount of FFP administered. So this is a single center study with only 19 patients and they did a retrospective analysis of 19 patients who also had the postpartum hemorrhage. The point is to examine whether um, the fibrinogen concentrate algorithm they develop is efficacious or not, and the amount of fibrinogen concentrate that FFP require for recitation can be reduced. So I'm going to go over this algorithm, the study or the use. So once they identify the massive hemorrhagic patient with fibrinogen less than 150, they administer um, fibrinogen concentrate based on a fibrinogen level. If fibrinogen level is really low, they use four gram of fibrinogen concentrate. Between fibrinogen level of 50 to 100, they use two gram, and if fibrinogen level is between 100 and 150, they use two gram. And um, the patients get a blood test such as PT-INR, and 
uh, cystic fibrinogen level check. If fibrinogen level is consistently low, less than 150, these patients group get four units of FFP. However, if fibrinogen level is greater than 150 and the patient is stable, they just closely monitor the patient. Um, so the result is that the blood loss is significantly lower in the study group and the dose and fibrinogen concentrate administered was higher. And um, what is significant is the amount of FFP administered was lower. So just to point it out that FFP um, and as well as like fibrinogen concentrate can be started given early in the um, hemorrhagic process as part of the uh, institutional protocol. The next few slides, even though it's not the main topic of my talk, I'm going to touch base briefly about TXA uh, as part of the uh, preparation. TXA is an anti-fibrinolytic agent. It um, forms a reversible complex and um, displays plasminogen and stop the fibrinolysis process or DIC process. It has a very good safety profile for perioperative blood loss for spine and orthopedic surgeries. However, for obstetrical use, it's fairly new. And I know that um, yesterday, um, the like, uh, presenters have already went over the woman trial, but I will safely, I will base, um, briefly touch base about woman trial and then our current UCSF um, TXA protocol. So uh, woman trial was published 2017. Um, there is a multi-country international trial um, in 21 countries and 193 hospitals. Um, the purpose is to see whether um, early administration of TXC will make a difference on um, dead hysterectomy and other outcomes. So the patients um, were randomly assigned to either receive one gram of TXC or placebo in addition to their usual care. And, uh, trial and row about 20,000 patients, and um, pretty much um, similar number in each arm, up to TXA and placebo arm. Um, the studies have found that dead due to bleeding is reduced in TXA group, 1.5% versus 1.9 in placebo group. However, hysterectomy was not reduced in TXA group, 2.6 versus 3.5, and this number is not statistically significant. Also, what is um, found, not part of what I uh, put it here, is all-cause mortality, um, including like hysterectomy, um, were not reduced at all. So, um, however, the adverse events such as thromboembolic events did not differ significantly in TXC versus placebo group. So the upshot is that um, if given early during the obstetrical hemorrhage, um, dead due to bleeding may be reduced. So this is our TXA protocol for postpartum hemorrhage at UCSF. So if um, the criteria is such that if bleeding continues after active management of the third stage, which is mean Pitocin and additional uterotonic agents was given, um, the patient may start receiving TXA. And the protocol is one gram over 10 minutes and may receive another gram if bleeding continues for another 30 minutes. So far, we have no adverse outcomes in our patient population. However, we also screen for the patient uh, with no prior history of thromboembolic events. And the rest of my talk, I will talk um, briefly about hemorrhage safety bundle checklist. So um, we have talked about blood products administering, uh, pharmacological agent, etc. However, um, this is not enough. We have to make sure that like labor and delivery units is, have a safety bundle checklist. So um, there should be a practice of assessment of hemorrhage risk for all the patient at any appropriate time. And there should be a hemorrhage response team, which includes multiple providers from nurses to uh, resource person to obstetrician to anesthesiologist. And hemorrhage card with supplies, checklists, and instructions um, for intrauterine balloon and compression stitches should be readily available. Um, there should be a routine assessment of quantitative blood loss instead of estimated blood loss to ensure that how much um, each provider know that what is the current blood loss. And um, all the providers should have immediate access to hemorrhagic medication, um, such as uterotonic agent and TXA. And each institution should have MTP protocol um, based on their needs. And there should be routine post-op debriefing drills 
and there should be unit-based um, will be hemorrhaged drills. And um, also there's a QI system to monitor the outcomes and to improve the quality. And finally, there should be ongoing educational programs for uh, each protocols and uh, like resources for all the providers, which include nurses and uh, physicians. Again, I just want to reiterate that the optimal preparation should be preparation of blood products, mass transfusion protocol, cell salvage, pharmacological agents, and um, safety bundle checklist. Thank you.